I'm joined today by the writer and critic Norman Lebrecht. Norman, of course, is extremely well known for writing about music and musicians and the music industry. We're going to be talking to him today about his novels, The Song of Names and The Game of Opposites. Norman, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Norman's first novel, The Song of Names, was published in 2002 and won the prestigious Whitbread First Novel Award. It's basically a story of two boys growing up together in wartime London. One is a genius, a violinist of extraordinary ability, and the other is not. Um, he, but he's the kind of symbiotic other half uh, without whom the violinist can't function. It's, so in a sense, it's, it's, it's a novel about the functioning of music, because music cannot exist without people of extraordinary ability and imagination, but it also can't exist without people of mundanity and practicality. Yeah. And so the story is basically of this genius growing up in, in London during the war, who disappears on the day of his debut, and in disappearing takes away half the life of, as it were, his symbiotic other half. And the song of names is the thing that pulls them apart and that brings them together again, or that may bring them together again, mm. um, in the course of the novel. The central character is, or one of the two central characters, mm. is Dovidal, mm. the, uh, the genius mm. prodigy. He's presented as, as both compelling to audiences and to individuals, but he also has this deeply repugnant side to him. And there's a great quote that I'd, I'd like to read out, and it's, by, um, it's said by the father of Martin, the, uh, the other boy. And he says, faced with a choice between saving the human race and having fluffy towels in their dressing room, they will always go for the towels. Uh, you're writing here as a novelist, of course, but um, it's impossible to ignore the fact that you're extremely familiar with the world of classical music. And I wonder if actually you think that that's an intrinsic part of what it is to be a successful soloist, that you have to constantly tread this line and live this paradoxical life of being hugely attractive um, and compelling to a very large number of people. But in order to do so, you need uh, to be quite unpleasantly self-serving. To a degree, yes. Nobody succeeds at anything without an, a, a measure of self-interest and detachment and, if necessary, callousness and cruelty. Graham Greene, whom I had the privilege of knowing, said famously, uh, there are no great writers without a sliver of ice in the heart. Mm -hmm. um, you do, so in, in, in art and creation, you express a great deal of warmth, you conjure up a great deal of emotion, but at the heart of it, there is always a line of vision, a detached line of vision, which sets you apart from what's going on around you and which can um, recoil against those who are closest to you. And that the line that you quoted from, from Martin's father, the impresario, talking about the artists whom he adores and who are the basis of his living um, and, and who occupy all of his waking thoughts. And at the same time, he, there is a part of him that holds them in contempt because he can see that there is a part of them that holds him in contempt. And that's, that's the nature of the relationship between the artists and the world, and particularly between the artists and those who engage them with the world. And it, that's one of the themes that I try to explore in the novel. Having observed managers, agents, um, orchestral directors, good, bad, indifferent, very few outstanding, <laughs> <laughs> over a very long period of, of observing and writing about music, there is this um, very entertaining line of mutual contempt that comes out over the second drink. And it may not be genuine. I mean, that's the beautiful thing in fiction. It, you can say it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be what they really feel. It can be what just comes out over the second drink. And that is an adjustment, that's a correction, that's a way of them coping with the feelings of humiliation they suffer at the hands of their artists. Is there a sense in which uh, your first novel is supposed to be slightly autobiographical? Is this why it's a musical novel. Mm, not really. Cause it's not autobiographical. I mean, there, there may be bits of me. But I wonder if that's, that's where the autobiography yes. lies. In, in your... Because in, in my professional life, well, I try to detach it from, from, 
what I did professionally. I, it, it was a sort of, it was a way of getting away from all of that. Yeah. You know, I'd sort of done enough of that. I've, mm. I've written 12 books about music. Um, I know how to write a non-fiction book. You yeah. go out, you do your research, um, you have a structure, you sit down and and you write it. And if at any point in the, in the writing of it, you find that you're blocked, it means you haven't done enough research, so you go out again. Yeah. And and that becomes a kind of formula for writing with fiction. It's completely different because the the characters take over mm. and you are at their mercy and you actually have to relearn everything that you've done about writing. So I didn't really want my other life to intrude into it, mm. but some of the subject matter came into it yeah. and, and I couldn't really escape that. Mm. And then once it did, then I suppose one was able to share through through the protagonists some of the things that one, has, one had observed. One of the other main themes and areas that you write about is, is of Jewishness and of mm. Judaism, um, and, and particularly how they relate to Dovidal. Mm. Um, and in a sense, he embodies one of the, the great 20th century symbols of, of sympathy. He's a, he's a child, he's, he's a Polish refugee, he's Jewish, his family have all been killed in the Holocaust. But on the other hand, he is, um, he's incredibly self-serving and he'll use people and discard them when they're, they're no longer of any value to him. I mean, in one sense, he's like any of us. He's, he's trying to find his place in the world. He's yeah. been blessed with a gift. He's been afflicted by the history of the 20th century. Uh, so he is both hero and victim. Mm. And some way out of that, he has to try and find for himself a resolution yeah. with his identities, because there are several, mm. as a human being, as an artist, as a Jew, as a Polish Jew, as an English boy in an English school, all of those things. Yeah. More than anything, he needs to find something that will validate his existence. Yeah. And the question there is, is it enough to play the violin? And I suppose the other question that lies in the heart of it is how do we cope with individuals of extraordinary ability? How do we cope with them within the family? How do we cope with them as friends? How do we cope with them as partners mm -hmm. in business and so forth? What is the language that we have to use in order to engage with people who, whose other life the ordinary person has no idea of? One of the characters that you introduce a real-life character, one of several real-life characters, including yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You've given it away. <laughs> is, is Joseph Hasid, Yosef mm. Hasid, mm. who I confess is, is it was a new name to me. Um, he, his life clearly has some parallels with uh, the life of Dovidal, mm. um, although it differs in some key respects. Um, could you uh, just tell us a little about Yosef Hasid. Well, he was a Polish violinist like Dovidal, older than Dovidal. He came to London to study with Karl Flesch, who lived up the road there in West Hampstead. Um, and uh, along with Ida Handel and Jeanette Neveu and various other famous violinists. Um, and he, uh, um, he suffered a mental illness. Um, and he uh, was put into uh, a mental home. He that finally they, they subjected him to a lobotomy and he died there mm. um, in the 1940s. Um, it was a tragic loss of an outstanding talent. I mean, everybody, Ida Handel is probably the last person alive who knew him, speaks of him as, as one, of the, one of the untouchables, um, but somebody whose life was, was plagued by, um, by illness. But in a sense, the way that, 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 that as it were, biography, autobiography, personal acquaintance intrudes upon the novel. When the novel was finished, when it was published, when it had won the award, when it was all, you know, all there and talked about, um, a photographer called David Farrell, who works with my wife, um, came round and asked to see me and uh, said, you know, how did you know about the Carl Flesch classes? I said, well, I heard about it from various people. He said, well, I was, uh, I was, I played the violin as a boy and he let me sit in on his classes mm -hmm. and uh, I, I knew Joseph Hasid. I said, no. He said, yes, we used to, uh, during the Blitz, we would go together, two boys, and go down to St John's Wood Underground Station and sit there on the platform, sleep there overnight. Mm. So uh, the reality intrudes on, on the fiction that I created. I want to ask you about another quote, which um, 
is possibly my favourite quote of the, of the novel, and it's by Dovidal himself, who misses his grand debut in London, which is meant to launch his career. Um, and years later, Martin goes and finds him and says, what happened? And, um, and Dovidal said this, I was made out to be the best violinist since Chrysler, but I did not feel that way. I knew that others would discover sooner or later what I already knew, that my reputation was many times greater than my ability. I was born with a curse of an intelligence larger than my talent. And I think this is a wonderful quote uh, for anybody whose career isn't quite going to plan. I, <laughs> I plan to use it frequently in the future. But I wonder uh, if you think um, that actually this almost willful ignorance of your own failings is something that you need to push yourself forward as a soloist or, or, or as a musician generally, um, or whether it's actually something that needs to be harnessed. I'm thinking of people like Monet and Stanley Kubrick who, who, who could doubt their talents hugely, but then of course produced great work. It's one of the most attractive facets of any human being, and in an artist it's overwhelmingly attractive. Mm. When you see someone for whom you have evidence that they are an outstanding artist, from whom you have respect and affection, and you see at the heart of it their own lack of belief, their own need for validation that what they are doing is important, is different, is essential. Mm -hmm. um, that's, 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 that's a compelling thing. There are artists who are smitten with self-doubt because they're not intelligent enough to appreciate what it is that they do. Mm -hmm. And there are others who are smitten because they are too intelligent uh, and, and they can actually see the bigger picture and they wonder whether this small thing that I do is, is that it? Yeah. Um, and those are the great ones. Those are the great ones. Mm -hmm. The others, I mean, there are plenty of others who mm -hmm. trundle along, um, believing the hype, yeah. are quite happy to come to every new town and be garlanded and celebrated and told they're the greatest on earth and they will beam and, yeah, yeah. and, 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 and luxuriate and those are the uninteresting ones. You're too young to have experienced the Second World War, yeah. but uh, you set your novel in the Second World War. Um, you have first-hand experience of the other areas that you discuss, Judaism and Jewishness, London, um, and of course music and the music industry. Why set the novel uh, in a period of which you have no direct experience? Again, the answer is I don't know. Why did it have to be in that period? I'm not sure. I think it's probably to do with, with autobiography. I was born in 1948. My sisters were all born in the 1930s and they raised me. So I grew up with these teenage sisters who gave me the sense that I'd missed all the fun. The war was when it all yeah. happened. You know, the war was when we got bombed, we got evacuated, we saw London Bridge burning, we did this, we did that. Um, and all I saw were the empty bomb sites. Yeah. And so somewhere in my unconscious is this idea that I should have come along sooner. Um, <laughs> uh, and then along with that, my parents had been very active in refugee efforts during the 30s and the 40s. And, and even as I was growing up, there was still a stream of people coming through the house and staying over because they had nowhere to go and or because they were between countries or because they were just coming back to say thank you. Yeah. So I, I grew up with that sense of... Um, unbelonging and fluidity and transience and and the chanceness mm -hmm. of life um which all stems from the 1930s the hitler period the war and the idea that people were really fighting for survival they weren't fighting for better, better living conditions or struggling for survival it wasn't for better living conditions it wasn't for another bathroom mm -hmm. it was mat matters of life and death um Somewhere within me, uh, there is a sense that I missed out. One of the characters in, in the novel is inanimate, which is the violin. Um, Dovidal is lent quite early on a, a Guadagnini, a beautiful Guadagnini violin, um, which comes to symbolise many things, I think, in a, um, I'm tempted to say in a, in a ring-like way, whether mm. that's Wagnerian or mm. Tolkien-esque, mm. it could be either. Mm. Um, it's lends the owner great power and, and happiness, mm. but uh, there's also a sense of liberation when it's taken back or it's lost. It's, it's about what it means to have a real relationship and to lose it. Um, 
and then to question every other relationship and to pose every other beside that as for its inadequacy. Set beside that the violinist and the instrument and you have a kind of artificial paradigm of non-relationship. In no other form of art is there a bond so strong as that between a violinist and the instrument. It possibly exists with viola players and cellists, they may tell you, but I don't think it's so. I think it's just violinists. No pianist feels for his piano as a violinist does for his violin. No person on any other instrument, no artist for his brush, no writer for his pen or hers. Um, the violin, violinist bond is unique in music because the violinist imagines that only through this particular in instrument, only through this particular tool, can he or she find expression. And the tool itself is then so connected with the player that it's named after the player for all time to come. So that a, a Stradivarius that was played by Vieton is still Vieton, who died in the late 19th century, is still to this day known as the Vieton Stradivarius, and the, the Chrysler and the Isai and so forth. Um, is that a real relationship? No, it isn't. It's, it's a kind, it, it sort of mocks the real relationship. It's the place in which the violinist can retreat because it's the substitute. Yes, it's not, you know, it's not the plastic doll. It's nothing of the sort. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is a, a, a valued relationship of a very different kind, but it is a place where the highly strung violinist, and I use the adjective advisedly, can retreat into a place of quiet, knowing that the fidelity is absolute, knowing this is a relationship, unlike any other, yeah. that cannot be breached. Yeah. But is there not a sense um, that you have to be, if you've got such a wonderful violin, you have to be equal to that violin? Um, and they thought... Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And therefore it's also an expression of your, own, of your own inadequacy. Yeah. You know who's played this violin before you. The pivotal moment in the book occurs when Dovidal hears the eponymous Song of Names, which changes his whole outlook on life and music. Song of Names appears in the novel as a means of memorialising the dead. And it's... To the best of my research, it has never existed, even though various people have come up to me and told me that they'd heard of it, they knew of it, but I haven't been able to validate it in any way. One of the primary duties in Judaism, actually probably the, at the highest duty of all, is to bury the dead and mourn the dead, remember them. Um, the first thing that Jews do when they set up a new community, when they move into a new place, is by land for a cemetery. Before they have a synagogue, before they have a school, before they have anything else, first thing you do, Abraham did it in the Bible, first thing you do, you buy land for a cemetery. Taking care of the dead is the highest priority. So during the Holocaust, when people were dying in droves, uh, and, and uh, many of them without families because their families had died already, there, there was no actual way of remembering them. And what I bring in is, is a Hasidic rabbi who finds a way of remembering them, who tells his followers, go out, and everyone that you see today who has died, everybody that you see on the street, get a name, bring me back a name, and I will work out a way of remembering all of those names so that when all of this is over, and should some of us survive, we will be able to find their relatives who will memorialize them in the Kaddish prayer. But we will conserve the names, even as they try to wipe them out. And the way of doing that was by theme and variations. Yeah. Um, many of the Hasidic rebbers were composers. In fact, the whole of Hasidic, Judaism starts with this idea of rejoicing in God rather than worshipping God. And the way of rejoicing, especially for people who were simple and in many cases illiterate, was to give voice to a song. So the Rebbers were composers and much of what they composed was done on a theme and variations principle. It's, it's I think I mentioned in, in the novel that the founder of Hasidism, um, the Baal Shem Tov, was actually born in the same year as Johann Sebastian Bach, the contemporaries. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the theme and variations uh, between what he does and the Goldberg variations, there are affinities there. And so it is possible, actually, to store hundreds, thousands of names in a tune with variations that these rivers would compose. And again, once I've finished the novel, I happen to be sitting with the friend of with friends whose father was over 
and he was singing something at the table. He was going, bum, 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 crack voice. He was a man in his 80s. I said, what's that you're singing? He said, oh, you wouldn't know. He said, uh, um, tell me. Um, he said, oh, it was something I learned, you know, as a child from the Rebbe. I said, you know, this really interests me because I'm, the means of transmission between the Rebbe's who, by the end of the 19th century, most of them lived deep in the country, in Poland and in Russia, and their followers lived in cities. Um, how did the new tunes get transmitted from where the Rebbe lived, 500 kilometers away, to where their followers had a community? And what was the means of transmission? He said, you're looking at it, it was me. <laughs> I said, how was that? He said, well, when I was a boy, I had a good ear and I had a good voice, and people clubbed together and they bought a train ticket, and I went out and um, would spend a week with the Rebbe, listening to all the new songs. And then I would bring them back and I would sing them to the others and we would all have them. I said, but how did you do that? He said, he said, look, it was simple. There would be a tune, it would go like this, and there would be another tune and it would go like this. And then the first tune would slightly change. And then the second tune would slightly change. And then they would combine. And then there would be, uh, um, the, the combination would breed a slight change to the right, a slight mm -hmm. change to the left. What I'm listening to is theme and variations. Yeah. And, and he was actually saying, and it went in fours, it went in eights, it went in sixteens, it went in thirty twos, it went in sixty fours. The mnemonic power of music, the ability of music to store information and to implant it in ways that cannot be erased, um, yes, that's, that's one of the things that finds its way into the novel. Suddenly, in the context of the novel, uh, music has a much more functional role. It becomes a tool for recording, for remembrance, um, and for remembering, suddenly totally subsumed under its religious and social context. Do you think there's a sense in which we've made the world of concert music, in a sense, so hermetically sealed and decontextualized that as musicians we find it hard to, to make sense of that? Is this really about Dovidal just trying to find sense in what it is he's doing? Absolutely, yeah. yeah it's, it's about finding meaning in music and finding the purpose of music. And uh, in, in a way that in the formalized structures that we have for presenting music, we often lose because we're overtrained. You know, anybody who gets up onto a concert platform this de these days is wildly overtrained in comparison to anybody who did that 50 years ago or 100 years ago, let alone 200 years ago. So they've lost the, the, the organic sense of making music just to make music. They're there to make music as a living, as a profession, as a vocation. Um, but uh, there have been so many strictures that have been drummed into them along the way from their first days at music school right the way through to the day they got accepted in an orchestra or they became a soloist or a conductor or whatever, that uh, the impulse has become hidden away at the heart of it mm. and the honest ones still continue to look for the impulse. Yeah. Many of the others don't bother. I want to talk a little bit, before we talk about your second novel, about the whole um, process of writing fiction. Um, you write about music and you write in a non-fictional sense, and you write about musicians and the music industry. I wonder, is there a different process in the way that you conceive a novel about music from the way you conceive a, a, a book about music? Do you... Completely different, yeah. completely different. When you're writing a documentary book, um, you have a grid, and you know you have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you, and, and you know roughly along the path that you're going. With, with the novel, the first thing that you discover is the characters. Once you've set the characters on paper, um, they get on with it. You don't, you know, you've, you've, you've placed two, four, six, eight individuals with certain um, preordained characteristics. Yeah. And then you, you just sit back, back and see how they interact and see what they make of the situation mm -hmm. that they found themselves in. So it's, as, as a writer, you're fairly helpless in that situation. You can tweak a bit, you can tune a bit. Um, but if you try to direct them, if you try to, push them down some preordained conclusion, you're going to create a false and very bad novel, so you don't do it. Yeah. You learn early on that, that it's an aleatory process. Yeah. Um, and I can honestly say that I didn't know how the novel was going to end until the morning that it ended. Your second novel, mm. um, The Game of Opposites, published in 2009, mm. um, 
is in many ways a very different novel, mm. but with a certain element of overlap. It's set in wartime, or I should say immediately after a war. Perhaps again, could you just tell us a little bit um, about what the novel is about? It's about a man who is thrown into a slave camp during a war, um, who every day marches the death march to the quarry from which many don't return. And at the end of the war, he goes to live in the village next to the death camp through which he and his friends had tramped the march every day. Now, why would anybody do that? And did anybody do that? Um, actually, yes. One hears testimonies of people who did. Yeah. Why? Again, it's about people. Mm -hmm. It's about how relationships are born and how they're formed and how they develop. It's about how, um, about whether, whether trauma can ever be healed or whether we can merely patch it over and put Vaseline on it. Mm. Um, it's about some of those big questions, but it's also a love story or several love stories. Um, it's about, it's about fear. What it's not about unlike the Song of Names, is ambition. <laughs> it's not about ambition. Although ambition comes into it, but it's not, it's, it's not about somebody who is destined for greatness or who wants to achieve a particular thing in life. It's about somebody who's blown about by life and tries to find his way through it. One of the things that I find fascinating about this novel is that you very deliberately, I'm, I'm assuming, withhold information from the reader. So you you can make an educated guess about which war it is, mm. um, but you never explicitly say it is. You don't say which country it's yeah. set in, um, and you don't explicitly say what any of the nationalities are um, or the religions. And again, you can make, mm -hmm. I think, pretty astute guesses. Um, and I know writers and composers don't like to be compared to other writers and composers, but there was something very, I felt, Kafka-esque about this, not in the sense of uh, you know, overbearing mm. bureaucracy and all that. But more, um, it reminded me a bit of the castle where um, we don't know what, where the castle is. You don't really know why yeah. the surveyor is going there, what's in the castle, why he can't get there and what surrounds it. And, it, um, and that in itself, let, you don't know why he can't leave there either. And it, and it creates a sense of really overbearing claustrophobia. I don't think, Kafka is a primary influence. I read him in my teens. I don't think I've returned to him since. And one, I, I suppose you assimilate that sort of thing. Um, he wasn't in my mind as I was writing it. I think what I didn't want it to be specific to any particular war or any particular oppression because there are certain common features that all such oppressions have in modern times. Um, and I didn't want it to make. I didn't want it to be the the. I didn't want it. I, I didn't want it to be harnessed to to any particular historical story. Although probably it's pretty clear what it is and where it is. Um, Paul is a piece of flotsam. If there hadn't been a war, he would somehow have blundered into a relationship, a marriage, and stayed in the same town where he was born and made a living somehow and possibly had some children and died. But that didn't happen. So he's blown around and he doesn't have the means with which to um, to re reinvent himself because there isn't that much to reinvent. Mm -hmm. He's not um, a hugely um, well-formed person. Uh, he's a person that accrues characteristics and 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 information and tastes and as he goes along yeah. he's to some extent a, a piece of blotting paper maybe most of us are mm. so when someone like that becomes a victim of great trauma um you really want to see how he's not just how he's going to cope with trauma you do it but it's the aftermath of trauma. That's interesting. How does somebody who has not been equipped for what he's been through then address the aftermath? Yeah. I don't think I withhold any information about his background. We know who he is. We know what he studied. We know that, that uh, 
he's done architecture even though his parents wanted him to do medicine so he has he has those two contrasting disciplines not which are not just disciplines they're also um they're philosophies that he has assimilated so they've given him certain tools with which to handle his situation his situation but then he has to handle it himself hmm. he has somehow to come to terms with who he is and where he's going to be and why does he not go any further than the next village yeah is there nowhere else that he can go is there nowhere else that he wants to go or is it that by staying in the village that the only way he can deal with what he's been through is by starting right there is there also a sense that without the war he wouldn't be a particularly interesting person yeah, ab absolutely Michael. Yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely it's made him interesting to others it hasn't made him interesting to himself yeah the novel explores this idea of things that initially appear to be opposite um, but which actually are seen to be obverse sides of the same coin um, and this is encapsulated in the in the eponymous game of opposites how does this work and and what's its relevance for your novel um it's what they call in the film world the MacGuffin. it's the hinge upon which the novel turns um the way in which paul starts to find his way out of the village or if you like out of the cell of the village that that, that that in which he's enclosed his mind is by seeing things differently from the common cliche so if by 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 addressing this game of opposites and by saying that things are not obvious and that's a kind of healing for him and it's a healing that he's then able to expand with the help of probably the most unorthodox psychoanalyst you've ever come across uh, you know in simple terms what is the opposite of black white but it isn't it can't be because black is not a color and white white is a nothingness mm. white is a nothingness and black is is something without they're both without color mm. so the opposite of black white has more in common with black than it has with any other shade yeah therefore the opposite of black can't be white if it's not white what is it it's non-black what's non-black it's gray hmm. so the the clearest example that you have of this is um when the doctor says what's the opposite of love and yes. after much to and fro it turns out that the opposite of love is death yes. um and um which is to say it's not hate it's not hate so no. uh no which because is... love and hate are two very strong emotions that are practically identical in many ways and of course that's totally encapsulated in the in the relationship paul has with his nemesis hans who is the former camp commandant right. who he eventually meets right. um and it turns out that he, he's obviously seeking revenge he wants to to kill him for what he, he did but it doesn't turn out to be that simple what is it about that relationship that makes it not so straightforward it's the question that every survivor asks why did i survive why me and not others what did i have to do in order to survive did i have to be like them in order to survive did i have to actually lose part of myself sacrifice part of myself did i uh, was I in any way a victim of Stockholm Syndrome, that I was identifying with the oppressors rather than with my fellow sufferers? Mm. That's the essence of survivor guilt. Yeah. And for Paul, to deal with Hans, to deal with the arch-oppressor, to deal with the, the acme of evil, means delving into himself to see was there anything in him that was like Hunt's? Mm. Or even worse, was there anything in Hunt's that was like him? And those discoveries are, are the most horrific things that he has to deal yeah. with. We come across this also in the character of the professor, who was also a former camp inmate, mm. um, and who has subsequently become a kind of mafioso, um, black market entrepreneur mm. um, but has also set about uh, 
taking revenge on, on people who ran the camps. Um, and he says, he gives up after a while, and he says one killing is much the same as another, and organising them is a logistical headache, which, and that's very much that same sense, isn't it? That actually, if you want to take revenge on, on something as big as, as, as a war camp, you have to become organised. And to become organised, you, you dehumanise the process. You become them. You become, you become them. them. You become them. And then you've lost your whole purpose in life. Yeah. And so that's, that's the struggle. How, how, how to handle them without being them. Yeah. And how to handle the memory of them. And how to build a world without those aspects of them. Yeah. Either in those around you or particularly in yourself. How to exorcise those things that you've experienced. Yeah. At the end of the novel you have uh, a character, Ed, who is a wartime American soldier who was involved in the liberation of the camp. And in, he has some parallels with Martin in your previous yes. novel, in that he is somebody who's come totally under the spell of Paul mm -hmm. and has grown old and has now returned to the village to, to expiate himself of this spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and while he's in the village, he, as an old man, he rediscovers Paul's psychiatrist's notes. Paul says to the psychiatrist, I know who I am when I'm unloved. And the psychiatrist says, or asks, unloved by whom, Paul? And Paul says, by me, by myself. Um, and I, I want to ask whether you think that having a relationship with somebody else inevitably implies a, a sort of, some sort of reduction of yourself. Yes, it does. But it's also about um, how we are healed. If we've suffered a great wound at any time in our lives, if we've suffered a bereavement as a child, or we've been through a war, or we've been through prison or camps, or any of those things, what is our capacity to heal ourselves? And what is, our, what is the capacity of civilization, be it medicine, be it psychotherapy, uh, be it culture, to patch that wound, yeah. to enable us to carry on. And those, those are some of the questions that I like to ask. Um, the issues that arise for Paul with his analyst, who is not an analyst, who is, who is the student of somebody that Freud threw out. In other words, who is, who is an iconoclast of iconoclasts, yeah. but who has himself been through trauma. Is that not a double negative? It, it may well be. <laughs> <laughs> it may well be. <laughs> it may well be. Um, and that, that's, that really just tries to delve upon and to touch those questions. And, and they are ultimately unfathomable. Um, I'm fascinated by the personality of the French singer-songwriter Barbara. I made a documentary about her a couple of years ago. She is um, Jewish, born in France in 1930, was in hiding during the occupation years, was raped by her father, was actually physically wounded by him as well, and carried those traumas with her through life. Um, and the evidence is grueling and appalling. And in the course of uh, the program, I asked a child psychiatrist in Paris who deals with many such cases uh, as to whether there is a healing, whether one can be healed. And she said, no, one can adapt, one can adjust. One finds a way of getting on with life, but you are never, you do never recover from these things. In the case of Baba, it was the songs that she wrote and she sang. It was the love affair that she had with her audience. Ma plus, ma plus belle histoire d'amour, c'est vous. Mm. Um, that enabled her to transcend the horror and the hurt. In Paul's case, it's the beginnings of an understanding and it's, it's the physical revenge that he wreaks upon his surroundings. Yeah. Um, these, these, these things together, the self-understanding and the way in which he's transformed the landscape, those are, are the coping mechanisms. Mm. Does he heal? Does he recover? No, no one does. 
If you'd like more information about Norman's novels, please visit this link. If you'd like to be notified when Norman's new novel is available, then sign up to either, or indeed both, of these Twitter accounts.